So last week I asked you what we should cover this week, and the votes are in. Point dear from please. I would be more interested in the point dear from first. Point dear from indeed please. A point dear from video gets my vote. Point dear from invex. So today, let's take our time and talk a bit about the point deform node and what goes on on the inside of it. And to properly dissect this node, I want to take you to a few steps of rebuilding this node from scratch in VEX. Well, at least a somewhat crappier version of this node, which is going to teach us some underlying principles on the way. And I'll be touching on the subject of linear algebra here and there. However, I won't dive deeply into it. So I'll just mention its applications and how we can use and abuse it to build a point deform node ourselves. If this gets you interested in the topic of linear algebra, I can highly recommend 3 blue, 1 brown C series The Essence of Linear Algebra, which is more than enlightening and is constantly blowing me away. And generally, I can highly recommend 3 Blue 1 Brown. I think it's about the best math lectures that you can watch online. Let's get to today's topic, the DIY point deform. So let's talk about a theory first. And our point deform will be working with three meshes, the high res mesh, drawn in blue here, the low resolution mesh in its rest state, so undeformed in orange here, and the deformed low resolution mesh in red. And we want to apply this deformation that happened between our low res mesh and our low res deformed mesh. We want to apply this deformation onto our blue high res mesh. And for that, we have to match our low res meshes points to our high res meshes points. And with these points that are identical at the same position in each mesh, it's trivial. As what we're going to be doing is for each point on the high res mesh, we'll search for points nearby on the low res mesh and then weight these points influence onto the high res mesh by its distance to the original high res mesh points. In this case, there is no distance, the distance is zero. So this point influences this point with a weight of one. It gets more interesting for this point here, which lies in between those four points on my low res mesh here. And in this case, our search for points nearby would come up with those four points in the low res mesh. And as they are uniformly spaced apart at the same distance from this high res mesh point here, each of those points would contribute 25% of its deformation to the deformation of the high res point. So after we matched and weighted those points, let's figure out how this low res mesh has been deformed. And we do this by subtracting each individual point's initial position from the deformed point's position. Take note that this only works if our point numbers stay constant between the non-deformed and the deformed mesh. So in this example, for this corner point here, from the new position, we subtracted the original position, resulting in this purple vector here. For all these other points here, those other three that would be of interest for this middle point here, the offset that we get by subtracting the new position, that's the position in red, from the old position, the position in orange is zero, so they do not contribute to our high res mesh points new position. Finally, let's move our high res point. In this case, it is influenced by those four points. Again, these three do not move, and each of those four points contributes 25% to the total offset, which in this case makes the math really easy. We just take this purple vector, move it over here to the point, and in this case, it would only contribute 25% to the total offset of our high res mesh point, moving this green point up here. And this is the first part of our deform node. So let's just recap what it does. We need to match our high res points to the low res points, weight the low res points influence on the high res points position by their distance to the high res point, then calculate the low res points offset and apply that with its respective weight to our high res mesh points. So let's build this first part by firing up Houdini and loading our mushrooms file from last week. So you can see I've got my point deform down here, working nicely, I'm gonna scrub here, and I'm just gonna work on frame 24 here. So just to be clear, this copy here is my low res mesh. Let's drop down a null here, call this one low, low res deformed, and this is my high res mesh. Let's just call this orange too. So those are the three inputs with which we're going to work. And the first thing I want to do is capture and weight those points. So from my undeformed low res mesh, I want to match those individual points here to points nearby on that high res mesh and store on those high res mesh points, which of those low res mesh points are close. Let's do that using a point wrangle and write a bit of vex. High res mesh points go into the first slot, that's the slot with the ID zero, and the second slot ID one goes into our low res mesh points. So now in this point wrangle, we are running in parallel over each individual point of this high res mesh here. And for each of those points, we want to find points nearby. For that, we need to specify the maximum search radius and the maximum number of points within which vicinity of each point we want to look for points and how many points we want to look at. Let's create two sliders to do that and store those values in two variables. One float called max dist for maximum distance. I'm gonna use a slider which I'll call max underscore distance. We're gonna create an integer called max num. I'm going to create an integer slider for that, which I'll call max number of points. 
Gonna create those interface elements here. And let's start on a maximum distance of 0.3 and a maximum number of points of, I don't know, say 64. Next, let's look up the points nearby. And for that, we're gonna use a function called near points, which will return a list of points. And to store a list of points, we need an integer array. So let's create that, call it NPTS for near points, brackets to denote that it's an array. And we're gonna fill it using the near points function. We're gonna look for near points coming in through this slot, slot with the ID one. We want to search from each of those individual points positions, which is stored as the at p attribute. We want to look within a maximum distance of what we dialed in down here and for the max number of points like this. Next, let's store this list of points as a point attribute so we can use it further downstream on our geostream here. Shorthand for this is i brackets at, so an integer array. And let's just call it npts2 equals to NPTS, that's what we use here. So basically we're just writing out the contents of this list into a point attribute here. Let's check if that worked by middle mousing on this. We can see we've got an integer list, an integer array called NPTS here, which we can also see on our geo spreadsheet. If we move over here, we can see we've got a list of points here. Back to our viewport and let's calculate the weights of our points. If you remember this diagram, we want to weight the influence of those points we find for each of our high risk points by their distance. So the maximum distance we're allowing is the max dist. That's what we dialed in in our slider as 0 0.3. And the minimum distance is zero. And basically we want to calculate each of the points distance that we found and remap its values. In our case, to be one where the distance is zero and to be zero where our distance of our individual points equals to our max distance, in our case, 0 0.3. Let's do that. And for that, we will need another list. Let's call this one weights. And of course, this should be a float, not an integer. And let's fill this by going through our list of near points that we found using a for each. And then looking up each point's position, call this one n pause. Like this. Next, let's calculate the distance, call this one n dist. Let's use the distance function for that. We want to get the distance between our current points position and the position we just looked up. Next, let's remap this, for which I'm going to use the fit function. I want to fit my incoming end dist value, which ranges between 0.0, .0 and our maximum distance. And I want to fit that between 1 and 0, like so. And finally, I want to push this fitted value onto my list with weights. So I want to append this using the push function. And to my list of weights, I want to push my now remapped Indist. And this is resulting in a squiggly green line here because up here I messed up and instead of a float, I should have used an integer for our point numbers. Again, let's middle mouse on this and we have not written out our weights yet as a point attribute. So let's do that. In this case, a list of floats called weights equals to the list of the weights we just calculated. And now if we middle mouse, we can see this list here. Again, let's have a look at the geo spreadsheet, go all the way down and we can see weights appearing here. Let's call this point wrangle capture and weight. Next, let's use the low-res mesh and the deformed low-res mesh to calculate the offset for each of those points. Again, dropping down a point triangle, and we're going to work on our non-deformed low-res mesh points. Deformed low-res mesh goes into the second input. Let's highlight this. And this is going to be a brief one. So what I want to do is look up this deformed mesh point positions, just creating a vector, call this one end pause, and it should be the point position coming in through our second input slot. And assuming that our topology and point count didn't change, just using the same point number as our non-deformed mesh. And then I want to write out a delta, that's the offset, which is equal to our new position minus our old position. That's the at p like this. So let's just visualize this, attaching a visualizer, setting this to be a marker, a vector, and we want to visualize our delta. So those are the vectors pointing from our old position to our new positions. Finally, let's deform our high-res mesh. So that's the one coming in through this point triangle that we just wrote. We want to use the data from the second point triangle in a third point triangle, which we're going to call deform. And let's call this one calculate delta or calculate offset. So high res mesh goes into our first slot and the info from our deformed low res mesh goes into the second slot. So in here, what I want to do is I want to sum up the offset values from these four points in this case, matching to this one single high res point, and also want to multiply them with their individual weights before I sum them up. For that, we in here need to create a few variables, starting off with a list of weights which we'll just load in from our attribute here. So we call this one weights like this. Also, let's load in our list of points. That means the points nearby on the low res mesh that we also looked up in here, which is an integer list. Let's call this one NPTS for near points. And I made a huge mistake up here. My floats that I'm loading are a float and not an integer. So, but my pointless are an integer. 
like this. Next, I'll need a variable to store the sum of my weights and the sum of my offset vectors. So two variables, one a float, call this one sum weights, and initialize it to be 0.0. .0. Also, I'm going to need a vector called sum offset or sum offsets, and initialize this to be all zeros as well. Then I'm going to iterate over all the points in my NPTs list here, again using a for each. And I need a helper variable, just a counting variable. In this case, I'm going to call it n, and I want to make this an integer and initialize it to be zero as well. So what I want to do each time I execute this for each loop, so for each element in my list, I want to increment my n. n plus plus is a shorthand for n equals n plus one. And that's the very last step I want to execute in my loop here. Let's drag this down. Next, I want to look up the delta for each of those points that are associated with our high res mesh points. Again, the delta is what we calculated back here. It's just the offset of our point. So let's load that in. Again, points are coming in from the second input slot. I want to look up the delta attribute on our point with the point number stored in NPT. Next, we have to weight this delta. So we'll have to multiply it by the corresponding weight in our weights list. Well, and let's call this weights, not weight. So we're going to look up a certain entry in our weights list. And the entry I want to look up has the ID of my counting variable n, just like this. And finally, I want to add this weight to our sum of weights like this, forgot a semicolon. And the very last thing I want to do is sum up all of our weighted deltas into our sum offsets. So now we have one vector containing the sum of all the individual offsets and another float containing the sum of all the individual weights. So to get our final offset, we will have to divide our sum offsets by our sum weights. And finally, what we can do is we can offset our current points position by our offset by just adding this to it, which results in this. Let's get rid of the point display and let's just ghost our low res deformed geometry, this one here. And you can see that in some areas like here or here, it is working okay. However, it's looking really terrible in these areas of the stems. And why is that? Let's get to part two of a theory, the part where it gets a bit hairy or hairier than before. Because what you saw in these distorted areas are points on our high res mesh that do not match perfectly with any point in the low res mesh and which are deformed not only by a simple translation, which is what we're currently doing with naively calculating our offset delta and applying it to our current high res points position, but they are also transformed by some shearing or rotating of the whole mesh. For example, in this case, basically, what I did is I took this quad, those four points, moved them over slightly and rotated them. So what we have to do now is we somehow have to try to extract this rotation that happened and which is applied to this point that is in between all of those four points. And the most elegant way to determine the rotation or shearing that happened between those individual points here is by using an axis system, which is stored in a transformation matrix. And in this example, we're going to do it in 2D, but the procedure is very, very similar for 3D. So in order to calculate an axis system, we need at least three points, the point we're interested in and two other points, maybe those two here or those two here that define the axis system. In this case, I'm going to use this point and this as well as this point. So we create our axis system by calculating the vectors that from the point we're interested in point towards two randomly chosen neighboring points. And we use these vectors to create what's called a transformation matrix, which is a list of numbers encoding in which direction the base vectors of our coordinate system point. Typically, your base vectors are x, y and z. So they point one along the x axis and zero along the z and y axis or the x vector, the y vector points one in y direction and zero in x and z axis and the z vector points one into the z direction and zero into x and y. However, in our case, this axis system here has been rotated. And just as with our position, we are only interested in the difference between our original non deformed axis system and our deformed axis system. In this case, we're not even interested in the offset. You see, I matched the point we're interested in down here. However, the math is a bit more involved, at least under the hood. For us as a user, it's rather trivial because when we dealt with the offset vectors, we could simply subtract our original position from the new position to get the offset. However, with matrices, we need to use the inverse of our original points axis system. So to get the transformation matrix, that is kind of the quote unquote offset between this original position and this newly rotated position here, which I called the delta transform here, I would have to calculate my original matrix, which I call original matrix here, then inverse this and multiply it by our new matrix, that's the rotated matrix here. And this for matrices in this case would be the same case as we did previously, 
by calculating our delta by just taking the new position and from it subtracting the old position. Again, this is extremely superficial and just from an application standpoint. And I have the feeling that we might need a premium course to cover these linear algebra topics and how they apply to computer graphics. So if you're interested into a deep dive of applied linear algebra for computer graphics, please let me know in the comments. Um, for today, I'll leave it at this. So now that we found the delta in our transformation matrix, how can we apply this to the point we're interested in, the yellow point here? As I mentioned, this is only relevant for points that have no perfectly matching point on our low res grid here. So this one is a good example. First, what we do is we transform our high res mesh points. So it's corresponding low res mesh point in this case serves as the origin. Basically, I'm taking this vector and subtracting it from this yellow vector resulting in this orange vector here. So basically, I'm translating my yellow point down here like this. Now I'll look up the transformed point matrix, the delta that we calculated. So this one here, this axis system, and I will multiply my transformed points position with this transformation matrix, which takes care of rotating this point from here to there. Then I will add back the low res mesh point offset. That is this green vector we previously subtracted from the original points position, which was here, moving this rotated point back here. And finally, as we're only interested in the transformation difference, not the absolute value of the point position, we're interested in this vector. That means what happened from the original point to the new point here. And to get that from this position, we subtract the original points position. Finally, yielding this brownish vector here, this small vector, which is our offset that has been created by rotation or skewing. Wow, what a ride. Again, let me know if you're interested in a linear algebra for computer graphics course. Let's head over to our beloved Houdini and implement this. So in here where I calculated the offset, by now it might be dawning on you that I'm not getting away with those two simple lines. So let's take a deep breath and dive in. As I mentioned, for each point we need at least two neighbors to calculate this axis system. So let's look up the neighbors. Again, returning an integer list of points. So let's look up our first point's position using the first neighbor we found and use this to calculate what I call tan one a tangent because this is tangential to the mesh, to the overall mesh by taking our current point's position and from it subtracting a direction that we just found. Next, let's do the same thing for the second neighbor we found. Again, to build an axis system, we at least need three points. So let's just copy this line here, paste it down here, reuse it, just look up the next point position here and create another vector, which we call tan2 for tangent2. Again, from the current point's active position, subtracting the end here we just looked up. Now, here comes another tricky part. As we're in three dimensions, we'll actually need three axes and we won't get away with those two axes we just calculated. In this example, the third axis would be a green vector here, just sticking out of the screen or pointing into the screen. So how can we calculate it? Well, there's a neat trick. If we take the cross product of those two vectors we just calculated, call this one tan1 and this one tan2, take their cross product and the cross product will yield a vector that is perpendicular on those two vectors. In our case, resulting in this green vector sticking out or pointing into the display. Let's call this vector up. And as I mentioned, it's the cross product of our tan1 and tan2 vectors. Finally, we are ready to create a transformation matrix, which is a three by three matrix in Houdini called matrix three. And we're gonna use Houdini's make transform function, which takes in two vectors to create a transformation matrix. In this case, I will use the normalized tan1. So we're gonna make sure that this vector has a length of one and the normalized up vector to create this matrix. And it also needs a name. Let's call this one X form or transform new because we just calculated the transforms using the data coming in through the second slot, which is the deformed geometry. Future Mo here. I am making a crucial mistake here. And if you know your linear algebra, you might notice it. I should not use V at P here. I just wanted to point this out. If you're wondering about this, I will correct this later in the video. Just be aware that I'm messing up a bit here. Okay, let's get going. Let's just copy this whole block, paste it down here. No need to look up my neighbors again. Also, I initialized all these vectors and I'm just gonna reuse them and overwrite them. And the only thing I'll rename is the X form new. It's gonna be the X form old. And in this case, we're gonna do the exact same calculation this time, just using the inputs from our primary slot like this. So we're now at this point where we need to calculate the difference, the delta or the offset in our transformation matrices using this formula here. So our delta is the inverse of the original times the new matrix. So let's create a new matrix, call this one total transform, and it should be the inverse of our old transform. 
times our new transform. Take note that the order of operations here is important as the matrix multiplication is not commutative. Finally, let's save out our total transform as a point attribute. Shorthand for a matrix three is three. Let's call this one X form for short and it equals to our total X form that we just calculated like this. Let's see. That seemed to have worked. A little mouse on it. Got our X form here, nine float values. So it's a three by three matrix. It's good. Let's save this, have a look at the geo spreadsheet there. And well, yeah, that's our transform matrix here. All right, let's use this in our deformation step down here in the last step. So instead of quote unquote, just applying our points offset, we need to take into account the transform matrix that we just calculated. And we also need to calculate the distance that the lowest point that we are referring to has to our high rest point. So we'll look at two vectors, call one OPOS for original undistorted position which is just the position of the points coming in through the second input slot. Again, working on our list of neighboring points. And also let's look up matrix. Let's call this one X form for transform. Again, coming in through our second input slot. So finally, we're ready to go through all of these steps that I outlined here. So basically a bunch of vector subtractions, then multiplying with the matrix and then adding it back to our original position and again a subtraction to generate the final offset. Let's go through this by creating a new vector, call it pause and it equals to our current active points position. First thing I'm gonna do is from our points position, I'll subtract the original undistorted points position on the low rest mesh. Next I'll multiply this by our transformation matrix. Then I've got to move my point back to our position. So I have to add O pause again to it, which I subtracted previously before transforming this. And as I'm finally interested in only the delta, the offset from this, I have to subtract the current high rest points position to get the delta. And this pause that I just created is what I will add to the offset group that we previously calculated and loaded in as a delta. So delta equals delta plus our current position. And this has gotten worse. And that is because I am a moron and didn't pay attention up here. What I want to do here is I don't want to subtract my high rest points position from a neighboring point on the low rest mesh, but instead I want to use my low rest points position up here. And now I'm getting proper deformations here. Let's save this and watch it in animation. So as you can see, this is working as expected. And it's pretty much what the point deform is doing under the hood. How do I know that? Well, when you drop down a point deform and right click on it, you can go to allow editing of contents and then dive in there and see the network that SideFX's TDs have built to pull this off. And this, although not exactly the same code that we just wrote, is doing basically the same thing with a bit more clever weighting for our transformation matrices to even out numerical errors with small angles of our access system that we're building to create those transformation matrices. But the overall algorithm is the same. I'm aware that this is much to take in, especially if you're starting out. And I do not expect you to fully grasp the linear algebra that's involved in here, especially not the matrix math that we used to extract those shearing and rotation deformations. And I think this needs at least a few videos to explain this more decently and more in depth. And if you think the same, just let me know in the comments. And also, if you're not happy about a premium course on linear algebra, let me know in the comments. But the takeaway from this here, I think should be a bit different because when I was in school, I had troubles connecting to the math that was taught and saw no application for this in the real life that I was living or was about to live. And boy, was I wrong. And today I kind of regret not having paid more attention or having put in more effort as I constantly have to look up those topics myself when I want to cover them. And now I'm slowly starting to get how important and how useful they can be. So I hope that I may just have sparked an interest in this kind of math and its application to computer graphics. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I highly recommend Three Blue One Brown's channel if you want to gain a good and deep intuition for this and other kinds of math. But I'm starting to ramble. So, you know, it's the usual drill. We're only able to do this as you guys support us. So consider supporting us on Patreon to gain access to more in-depth courses, to everyone supporting us. A massive thank you, especially to important looking pirates, Rafik Anadol and Chris Abair. Thanks so much, guys.